In the previous videos of this playlist, we've extensively discussed the muscles that make up the anterior abdominal wall. Those are the pyramidalis, the rectus abdominis, external and internal abdominal obliques, and the transversus abdominis muscle. Now we're going to shift gears and talk about the muscles of the posterior abdominal wall. And we're going to begin in this video by discussing the psoas major and the iliacus muscles. But in the next few videos, we'll move into talking about the quadratus lumborum and the psoas minor, which may or may not be present in some individuals. So, the iliopsoas muscle group. When somebody uses the term iliopsoas, they're referring to a group of two muscles, and those are the psoas major and the iliacus. So in this picture over here on the right, this is a coronal or frontal section of the abdominal and pelvic cavities, and they've removed the entire anterior portion. And basically right over here, we're seeing the posterior abdominal wall. Up here is the diaphragm. We're not concerned about that right now. Now if you look at this thin muscle right here, you can see a very thin tendon going down. Don't get confused. This is not the psoas major. This is actually the psoas minor muscle. We'll be talking about this in the next video. This is not an official part of the ilius psoas. In fact, some people don't even have this muscle. So if you remove the psoas minor and look behind it, there's a much thicker, so all the way from over here to here, a much thicker muscle, and that is the psoas major. And you can follow its muscle belly going all the way down. It actually, unlike the psoas minor, exits uh, the pelvic cavity and actually moves into the anterior thigh where it attaches on the lesser trochanter. So this is the psoas major posterior to the psoas minor. And then over here, we have the iliacus muscle, and it's named so because it actually sits on the iliac fossa of the pelvis. So let's go into more detail on the psoas major, which you can see right here. The psoas major is going to have origins on the vertebral bodies of T12 through L4 and the associated intervertebral disc. We might be able to see this a little bit better in this picture. So psoas minor has been removed, so here in green is psoas major. You can see here, here's T12, L1, L2, L3, and L4, and then there's a little bit of blending of those tendons right there onto the intervertebral discs in between those vertebral levels. And it also has origins on some of the transverse processes from L1 all the way down through L5. You can actually kind of see the transverse process peeking out back here. A little bit would actually attach on that as well. Now, if we follow the muscle belly of psoas major down, eventually we'd get to sort of a musculotendinous junction, and the musculotendinous junction of psoas major is gonna blend with that of iliacus, which we'll see in just a minute, and eventually they form a common tendon. And that common tendon is gonna exit from the pelvic cavity, and it's gonna attach here on the lesser trochanter of the femur. And that common tendon, is referred to as, sorry for the misspelling there, the iliopsoas tendon, or sometimes called the conjoined tendon, because it's conjoined between the iliacus and the psoas major. Okay. Now the actions of psoas major include those at the hip and the trunk. So in terms of the hip, it's going to facilitate mainly hip flexion. This is one of the major hip flexors, the other being iliacus, and beyond that we have rectus femoris, one of the quadriceps. And it also can weakly assist with hip external rotation, although we have a bunch of other muscles that do that normally, like the gluteus maximus and the hip external rotator group. Now in terms of trunk movement, we're thinking of movement that occurs relative to the level of the navel or the belly button. Okay? And so if the psoas major contracted unilaterally, we'd get some weak ipsilateral lateral flexion or ipsilateral side bending. In other words, if the right psoas major contracted in isolation, we'd get weak right side bending. Okay? Now in reality, it's going to be very weak and it is not a prime mover of that motion. That motion's prime mover, so side bending of the spine and the trunk, that's going to be the obliques. And there's going to be even a little of a contribution from the erector spiny muscle group contracting unilaterally. This is going to be barely any contribution, but it can assist a little bit. Now, if we look at the innervation of psoas major, notice it's different 
from that of the iliacus. So for psoas major, the innervation is going to come from the anterior rami of spinal nerves L1 through L3. And then the blood supply is via lumbar branches of the iliolumbar artery. Okay. Now for the iliacus. Iliacus is now shown in green here. You can see that it originates off of the iliac fossa. This is actually a convergent muscle, and technically the psoas major is convergent as well, but the iliacus kind of has that typical convergent shape, very broad origin, where it just kind of sits in the iliac fossa. And then again, as you go distally or downward, uh, it's going to come to a musculotendinous junction, which starts to fuse with that of psoas major, and eventually they have a common tendon that goes down, that's the iliopsoas tendon, where it then will insert on the lesser trochanter of the femur. Okay? Again, it has actions at both the hip and the trunk. Like psoas major, it will facilitate both hip flexion, it's the prime mover of hip flexion, and weakly assist with hip external rotation, and then contracting bilaterally, it will also be a very weak trunk flexor. Again, the major trunk flexor is the rectus abdominis muscle. Now, unlike the psoas major, which has innervation from L1 through L3 anterior rami, the innervation of iliacus is via the femoral nerve, nerve root levels L1 through L3. Okay? Now, the femoral nerve innervates some other muscles as well. The main one we usually think of is the quadricep muscle group. Rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, intermedius, and medialis, right? Femoral nerve also innervates sartorius, and then the other one is iliacus. And the blood supply is via the iliolumbar artery, deep circumflex iliac artery, obturator artery, and the femoral artery. So what is the clinical relevance of the iliopsoas group? Well, it's something we call sitting disease. This is not an official disease, it doesn't have a billable code that you can use, but it's something that we describe in physical therapy that kind of encompasses a huge variety of symptoms and presentations for people that sit all the time and are sedentary and have been doing that for a very long time. One of the things that happens is hip flexors become tight. If you think about sitting all the time, when you're sitting, you might be right now, your hips are flexed. You're not actively using the iliopsoas, but you are putting that muscle, or muscle group I should say, in a shortened position. And if you are chronically having that muscle in a shortened position, what happens? Adaptive shortening, tightness, contracture, whatever you want to call it. So the hip flexors can become tight, and that's associated with sitting disease. Hip pain is associated with hip flexor tightness and also in that whole sitting disease realm and then femoral nerve entrapment. So looking at this picture here, we have sitting nicely in the iliac fossa, this is the iliacus, and then over here is the psoas major. Now, the femoral nerve originates from the lumbar plexus, so once it's formed from that, it has to eventually gain access to the anterior thigh and first exit the pelvic cavity. So to do that from the lumbar plexus, it actually travels behind the psoas major, you can't see it here, and then eventually it kind of comes out in front of the psoas major, but as it does that, it's actually moving between a tiny space between the psoas major and the iliacus, okay? And then it'll go under the inguinal ligament, ultimately gain access to the anterior thigh, where it will then go and innervate the quadriceps and the sartorius muscles. Now, the femoral nerve is a mixed nerve, so it also provides some sensory innervation to the anterior thigh. Now, if the iliopsoas, so the hip flexors, are very tight or spasming, especially if you put someone in a position that potentially stretches those muscles, like hip extension, or even just lying in prone for some people, that tightness can reduce the space available for that femoral nerve to exit. That can entrap the femoral nerve, and so what some people will have is a shooting pain that goes down the front of their thigh. If it's down the front of their thigh, you know it's not sciatica, because sciatic stuff goes down the back of the thigh. If it's down the front of the thigh, if it's a shooting pain like that, it's very likely femoral nerve entrapment, and that can happen when these muscles of the iliopsoas group are tight.
The other thing that can happen is excessive anterior pelvic tilt. So the hip flexors are gonna to tend to anteriorly tilt the pelvis. And so if they're tight, you're gonna have somebody who postures with anterior pelvic tilt or too much of it. So that can be brought out in a postural assessment. And oftentimes excessive anterior tilt will be associated with weakness of the core. Um, and in this case, it's mainly the rectus abdominis muscle because that's the one that will counteract the downward pull of the psoas. It'll actually uh, tend to actually posteriorly tilt the pelvis, okay? And then here's some special tests used to delve into hip flexor tightness. Now, a cautionary word on the first one, Eli's test, also called the prone knee bend. As the name suggests, the person's gonna be positioned in prone. Now this test specifically looks at tightness in the rectus femoris, not the iliopsoas. However, if somebody has extremely tight iliopsoas, they will not be able to get completely in prone with their hip crease fully on the table. So if somebody tries to get in prone and their waist or their hip crease is off the table, that's a very good indication that they may have tightness in the iliopsoas. And if the tightness is significant enough and they have femoral nerve entrapment, it may reproduce that uh, shooting pain down the front of the thigh. But it would have to be pretty significant tightness. Where you're better off looking is the Thomas test and the femoral nerve tension test. So the Thomas test takes a little bit of practice to interpret because there's a lot of things to look at. But again, you can differentiate the rectus femoris tightness from iliopsoas tightness in the Thomas test. And again, you can also get uh, the femoral nerve uh, radicular type of signs down the front of the thigh. And then there's also the femoral nerve tension test. In any case, if somebody has tight iliopsoas or hip flexors in general, one of the best stretches that we use is called the modified Thomas stretch. And we'll be going over that in other videos. There's another clinical consideration for the iliopsoas, and it's called a psoas abscess. This is something that if somebody ever presents with this, they need to be sent to the doctor because this is not something we are going to be able to treat. It actually requires medical treatment rather than physical therapy. So a psoas abscess is a rare medical condition that is defined as a painful collection of pus, so it's an abscess, in one of the iliopsoas muscles, either the iliacus or the psoas major. Um, so let's say you're going through physical therapy, the person's not making any improvement, um, and they have pain that seems specifically kind of in the abdominal area, kind of in the hip flexor area, maybe uh, active range of motion hip flexion or resisted range of motion is painful. You might consider looking at the psoas sign. We'll be going over that test in a future video. It's also called Cope's Psoas Test or Obrastova's sign. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And if that test is positive, it's very likely to indicate a psoas abscess, in particular if you've been given typical treatments and the patient is not getting better. Okay? And the treatment for a psoas abscess is going to be a combination of antibiotics and draining the abscess. And again, that's something that a medical doctor would need to do, not a physical therapist. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the iliopsoas muscle group. In the next video, we're gonna be going into the quadratus lumborum and the psoas minor. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.